just once again remind everybody exactly how this bracket looks. If you guys head over to fanatic.com, you can see uh, all of the coverage for the event. You can also see uh, the bracket and how this is run. Eclipsia just defeated Fnatic 2-0, and we're about to watch the second semi-final. Immediately after that, it will be the grand final, in which one of these remaining three teams will pick up $1,000. Winner takes all. Uh, it has been a whole lot of fun. And Zote, potentially, you know, six more epic games coming our way. I, I sure hope so. I would love for a full six. Uh, we'll see. We only got a two-game series the last time. Eclipse is looking very, very strong against Fnatic. Whoever gets through this group is going to have their hands full with them as well. But I'm excited to get back into these games. Always so very good. So we'll just see here, uh, we're waiting for everybody just to go 100% ready. Uh, of course, Megashock will be on the left-hand side of your screen. I do need to update my name overlays this time around. Um, and we are running a little bit behind schedule, but you really don't mind when we have so many epic games to shoutcast. Mega Shark and the Game Hoppers, of course. Uh, for anybody that doesn't 100% follow me yet, both Team Mega Shark and Game Hoppers have been around on the scene for the better part of the last sort of you know two to four months. Um, have been doing very very well against some of the uh, uh, professional sponsored teams, etc. And they're definitely the guys that are that need to be watched. Now these are the teams that are going to be taking down the champions, taking down the super big names and like we've just seen Eclipsia going up against Fnatic, Fnatic would have been the favorites in that match um, and, and Eclipsia, Eclipsia is somewhat of the underdogs but 2 owing Fnatic and uh, a potential for some more awesome games from some really strong teams. Yeah, 2 0 and both of them were in pretty dramatic fashion that last game. So incredible to watch. It looked like Fnatic was playing tower defense like they were going to really push it into very, very late game. Took a team fight 5 to 0 at about 45 minutes in. Um, you know, in any other situation except when you have three inhibitors down, that generally means a win for your team because you have you know, 50 seconds, over 50 seconds on the entire opposing team where they're just dead. And it was, you know, five kills in relatively quick succession as well. So had they not been forced back into their base, they would have been able to push for the win. But as it was, they weren't even able to get an inhibitor back. And we are into our next game. So hopefully we have one that can kind of live up to the hype that the last game has led us to expect. Uh, very good games from all of these teams. So if Banton picks going out, Game Hoppers will be on the left hand side of your screen. Team Mega Shock are going to be on the right hand side, so that's going to be wearing the red trunks. And uh, just another quick reminder to everybody myself and Zote, we have been using Red Call the entire evening for this cast, and we will also be doing um, a few minutes of uh, uh, QA after the grand final this evening. So register your accounts, head over to the Fnatic channel, it is Leet14, and it's uh, completely free to use. and uh, really, really cool voiceover IP if uh, you've got a team and you know, want to play competitively or even just chat to your buddies. So, two quick bans, Shen and Karthus. I wonder if we'll see a Nocturne ban as well, those globals and, and semi-global ultimates. Nobody really wants to deal with them. Yeah, in the last series, we really saw unusual bans, especially for Game 2 when Fnatic decides to ban out, you know, Renekton off of Zelzor, uh, banned out Nunu, so I'm so fresh, couldn't play him in the jungle, and I forget who the third ban was, um, but it was also a targeted ban against one of the opposing players, uh, so they couldn't use any of those champions, and as you predicted wisely, Nocturne is banned out as well, so more of the standard bans, uh, Morgana coming down, as well, and who will be the last two? I mean, Malphite, Rumble still up there. Alistar is always a dangerous person to allow the other team to have, especially in the jungle, but works very well as a bot lane support too. So there's still, you know, a large number of champions that could potentially be banned here. Only six bans, 100 champions. And don't, 101 in fact. And don't forget that both Ari, oh, right. Ari and Zyra are available in, in the pool. Um, interestingly, Mordecai is being banned out. This this smells to me like a a, a counter strat. We do not want somebody playing that um, Mordecai. We do not want Mega Shock using him either in that top lane or that middle lane. But again, so many strong champions available. You know, Zyra is there, Ari is there, um, Sona is available as a support for first pick if they want to go that route. Uh, and she does seem to be the the favored support at this moment in time. 
Yeah, I think Kowtar does play a very good Mordekaiser. That Kemet is banned out as well, so I mean that does leave a lot of, you know, the standard picks that Alistar and a lot of people that could potentially be picked up here. Uh, Mordekaiser, or not Mordekaiser, uh, the Alistar and who else was I thinking? Who do we always see that's very, very dominant? Well, I'll get back to it in a moment when I can think of Oh, and Malphite, of course, are the two that I was really afraid of. But we actually see Hawkdawn picking up an early Zillion, and that will almost certainly be a Zillion in the middle. Very hard to counter, has good range on those bombs. Of course, grants his whole team that extra experience, and I love support middle champions, and they're finally coming back and coming to the European side of play. We've seen Alex Stitch running a lot of AP Jana. I think we saw him playing Zillion as well, and we saw Zillion yesterday in this very tournament as well well and it's just so devastating really dominates a lot of lanes and then has great utility as the game goes on into the later fights and just a little bit of a shout out to Brooke Lee uh, thanks for contacting thanks for message Kowtard is famous for his Mordekaiser so you know that's mm -hmm. that's something coming out from the players coming out from opposing teams and of course Al Mopo would have known that as well so uh, removing that one from the pool I like the Sona Ezreal combination we've seen it used multiple times over the course of the last two days and done very very well but equally as effective the Soraka and Corky combination who is the more effective aggressor in this situation? Um, obviously, the range and the poke of Sona and Ezreal are going to be very good, but the sustain and the burst that both of those champions put out can be healed quite effectively from Soraka as well. It can be healed. It depends if they they are you know if they're singular battles, and certainly Sona and Ezreal have that advantage uh, if they can continue on with their aggression. But if they only poke a little bit, then back off. Sona's, obviously, rather, Sorak is going to be able to use Astral Blessing, heal up the health, use Infuse, heal up the mana of Corky, and they're going to come back into the fights uh, you know, at full life and full mana, where the mana from Sona and Ezreal will you know, go down over the course of time. So, of course, you have to worry about that, and I always have the same prediction. Whenever you're facing against a Soraka lane, if you don't kill him before level 4 or 5, then you're going to run out of mana and life to be able to engage on them at level 4 and at level 5. We did see kind of a joking poppy lineup. It is going to be a Lee Sin pickup for Team Megashock. Don't know yet as that will go in the jungle or in the top lane. Of course, very viable in both of those positions is Lee Sin. Lee Sin, of course, so, so strong in the jungle. Those low-level ganks are incredibly powerful. He's able to get very, very mobile and get around the map. Um, I wonder how effective it's actually going to be when uh, you consider the lanes that are they're going to be coming up. You know, Zillion, of course, almost impossible to gank at level 6. He's going to have that Chrono Shift, going to be able to bring himself back to life and uh, and just get away from, from any of those big ganks. And I wonder if Lux is going to be locked in. Um, no, it, it, it <laughs> they need a jungler. Need, so. Yeah, there we go. I was like, no, hang on. Who's going to be in the jungle here? Aurelia jungle. That's that's not going to work. Um, so Leeson, I'm a big fan of the selection. Uh, can Leeson defeat Aurelia in the top lane? Leeson can beat Aurelia in the top lane. He is one of the people that can go toe to toe with her. Of course, use that crippling strike, that tempest and cripple uh, to slow down her attack speed and really. You know, Aurelia relies a lot on that attack speed to do consistent damage and to do that true damage. Of course, Lee Sin has good sustain as well with Safeguard and Iron Will. can just heal up a lot of the damage done to him. And of course, he doesn't have those mana issues that Aurelia will run into. Not to a great extent, but will have a little bit of issues with. It looks like more likely we're going to see that Malphite go into the top lane to counter Aurelia. And then Xin Zhao is picked up from Game Hopper. So that is very, very exciting. We get to see the reworked Xin Zhao in this tournament. And I'm going to make my life so difficult because it's another champion that I've never actually played and I don't know his ability names. So I'm going to have to learn that one. But uh, <laughs> Xin Zhao, with the uh, speed buff that's going to come from Time, uh, I think it's Time Warp from um, Zillion, it's going to allow him to just stick to a target and guarantee that he gets that third auto attack proc, guarantee that he gets the knock up in place and of course his ultimate has been reworked for those of you who don't know it will in fact push everybody backwards uh, so we did this with Zyra uh, yesterday if I recall uh, or no a couple days ago uh, and I think I'd like to do it with uh, uh, Zin Zhao as well I'll actually open up the champion and just quickly run through the abilities in case anybody is a little bit unfamiliar with how they work and give myself a quick refresher on how it works as well uh, right, let's see, what is his runes and masteries? 0, 21, 9 in terms of runes, 15% attack speed, additional attack damage, armor, and magic resist. 
And that's kind of a quick, quick look at how this is going to work out. Uh, all of his abilities, passive, of course, uh, challenges a single target, reducing its armor by 15%. And that is going to be applied by uh, whoever he lands an auto attack on, if I recall correctly. Three Talon Strike, it's going to uh, increase his damage. And of course, on the third proc, will knock somebody up into the air. That, in conjunction with the time warp from um, uh, uh, Zillion, is going to be very, very powerful. And of course, Battle Cry is going to allow him to increase his attack speed as well as gain some lifesteal on every third proc. That's really what's going to be helping him out in the jungle. Audacious Charge is going to be his dash, his gap closing ability. And of course, it will slow all enemies in an area. So that's an AoE slow, and it's a pretty large uh, area of effect. And then finally, his Press Ultimate of Crescent Sweep. This is the ability I'm most looking forward to. That AoE knockback. I haven't seen Xin Zhao played by too many people in uh, professional play. How effective is that Crescent Sweep against uh, teams like Malphite who are going to be diving in? It should be pretty effective, and of course, I, you know, it's a big deal in addition to the amount of bonus armor and magic resist he's going to be able to get. Um, is Xin Zhao going to use that to protect the back lines? I don't really think that's going to be a strategy. I think he's going to try to jump in on top of Sona, on top of Ezreal, on top of Annie, and then try to kind of knock them back from the fight. But most recently, I've seen some really great plays kind of on the North American side. Being able to manipulate all those knockbacks using Janna, using uh, Anivia as well to really separate the tanks away from the damage line. So really the whole entire damage line has to focus on one person, Xin Zhao in this case, uh, while your back lines clean up the opposing tanks. Are they really going to win that trade though? They, do they really want to allow Lee Sin and Malphite to get to their back lines? Both of those champions are going to be very, very tanky uh, as it gets towards late game. I don't know that they're going to necessarily uh, be able to compete with their tankiness with the likes of Xin Zhao and Aurelia. But yeah, both teams have two really great diving, uh, diving champions, diving bruisers that can get into those back lines and hopefully interrupt them. Uh, what do you think about the Zillion and Annie in the middle lane? Uh, both champions not too popular over here in EU. Uh, you've seen some great Zillion play coming out of Alexich from Moscow 5, for example. But Annie, it's been a long time since she's featured in a professional lineup. <laughs> I think the great thing about Annie and the reason why she's such a great pick against Zillion is because she can essentially 100 to 0 uh, the enemy AP champion. And that's what you need. You don't want Zillion to be able to use his resurrect, use that chrono shift, allow people to come back to life and then you know continue to bring your people back. Uh, that's what they certainly do not want. They want their ganks to be effective. And especially, I mean, they have the Lee Sin coming in for ganks, but Lee Sin doesn't have any sort of hard CC. They really need to completely burst Zillion down, ensure that he does not use his ultimate and come back to life because, you know, it's kind of just like a reset of the battle and his ultimate will be down. If he does get his ultimate off, Zillion that is, he'll just come back and be almost brand new, be fresh as new, we'll have enough AP to give him a substantial amount of life. So I do... I like the Annie pick against it. The only issue is, early game, Annie has, you know, a very limited range insofar as her spell damage goes. She has good range on her auto attacks, but she is outranged by Zillion with those spells. Um, so I don't know that she's going to be able to counterattack, going to be able to be aggressive against those time bombs spamming down on her in that early game, early laning phase. And of course the time warp from Zillion is going to be very effective as well. Not only does he outrange, but he's going to be a lot more mobile. You know, time bomb, time warp, rewind, time warp away to, to safety once you've got a couple of ranks in it. Uh, just a quick little anecdote once we're looking at the skins. The first two skins I ever got, the first one was the uh, Emo Annie. Um, I can't remember what the actual name mm -hmm. is, but it came with a, a Steam special price bundle uh, when League of Legends was available <laughs> on Steam a little while ago. And uh, of course the the uh, uh, Four Leaf Clover Malphite is just one of my favorite skins. It's just so mm. atrociously ugly. But that's why I love it. We actually might see a little bit of aggression coming in from Team Megashock. They look like they want to invade that blue going in through the back route. We'll see if they are going to do it. They've got a pretty aggressive low level team. Annie, uh, did she actually charge her passive? Is busy doing so. How? Oh, what's her mana regen? So only 8 mana per 5 and down to 120 odd mana. But her passive is up. And she does of course have that incinerate which means it's an AoE stun. Al Mupo and Ember Sheep just 
taunting one another and you actually hear the taunt you will lose mega shock facing off against their ex member al mupa only just recently left the mega shock lineup for game hoppers and from what um uh, as Zupix actually said to me yesterday, there's no bad blood. They said they, they understand why he left, and, and he mentioned it earlier. He didn't want to go into detail. So as long he's good friends with them, and it was just a personal decision. So good luck to him and the rest of his team. Yep, and we do see an early ward placed down by Soraka, so that's certainly going to help out Aurelia survive through those early ganks. And you have to be worried about that. With Lee Sin, he has some of the most devastating level 2 ganks, level 3 ganks. Pre-level 6 ganks are just Im amazing and then of course when he gets to level six he gets dragon range and he can suddenly push you further back into your own lane which is very very scary so really is going to have to be on the back foot worried about those ganks all through the landing phase but the good thing is she did get help from her support did get that early ward up there now, Lee Sin is going to be starting off on that blue buff uh, and will be mirrored by Jin Zhao going up into this top lane. And uh, I haven't seen too much of the rework Jin of the jungle. Opting to start with three talent strike over his battle cry. Um, is that sort of the standard on Jin? Uh, how much have you seen of him? I have not seen very much either. I mean, when you're just getting this level 2 with a blue buff, it doesn't matter too much. And having that auto attack reset from 3 Talon Strike is really, really a big bonus. Uh, so we're actually seeing him go 1 point into 3 Talon Strike and then Audacious Charge as his second pickup. So really interesting second pickup. And it looks like Goats is really avoiding his Wraith Camp. He probably feels that it has been warded, but it actually hasn't been warded. So uh, he's taking the longer route and not really, you know, saving himself much time there. But he does have his smite up and ready to go, regardless for this quick red buff takedown. Whereas Zinja, you know, also saved his smite, but is going straight for the race and then will head to red buff. Um, it will not likely be quite as healthy as Goats is uh, when he comes out of that uh, comes out of that jungle. Now, what do you think of this ward placement here that's come out of uh, the, um, the game hoppers? It's in the river, but it's on that ramp, in fact. So, a little bit of a unique placement. The vision is somewhat limited, but it is, of course, going to allow them full vision of the river, allow them to actually or see whether or not they're actually going to be able to get in or not. I like it. I mean, the only... I mean, it was a safe ward to put down, so that's one reason I like it. We do see that gank, you know... Being being threatened in the Ooh. top lane, El Mupo has to be very, very careful. Kaltod was trying to pick up a kill onto Hawkdon, landed the stun from his passive, which is of course Pyromania, followed up with a Disintegrate and Incinerate, and actually threw down the Ignite as well. But Hawkdon was able to, to get away because of course Annie's cooldowns are relatively high, but I wonder if we're going to see Goats attempting a very low execute, or low level execute. Yeah, and yeah, Hawkdown really has to be careful here because Annie's flash is still up, so got to range without that coming down. Uh, will avoid that first uh, sonic wave heading out there, will not get resonating striked on. But Kautar still going to be very, very dangerous, you know, coming up. And if Lee Sin wants to swing by once again, uh, you know, they can guarantee a stun coming down on Annie. And Zillion is also running out of mana here. So, you know, having to use that time warp a couple of times to speed himself up, get away from tricky situations, means that he doesn't really have that much mana to harass with. I'm watching this bottom lane now, um, and it's Corky and Soraka coming up against Ezreal Sona. We know the burst heal from Soraka is very good, and if she can time it correctly, can um, heal up a lot of the burst that Ezreal and Sona are going to be putting down. But who is the more effective lane in terms of sustain? You know, the 20 second cooldown on Astral Blessing and the burst heal, or the cords that's coming out of Sona, but the high mana cost? Oh, the more effective sustain lane is definitely the lane with Soraka. Always so, so effective uh, with that mana regen. And Sona actually, you know, I checked in before the game, is running quite a bit of mana regen in those runes. But even with all that mana regen, she's, you know, below half. Whereas, you know, Soraka, look at Soraka, is completely fine on her mana. Is about 90% mana still. Oh, in middle, Hawkdown barely escaping like once again from that resonating strike uh, coming out. That sonic wave resonating strike combination from Lee Sin. So Lee Sin been very aggressive in these ganks, but unfortunately they've been unsuccessful so far. We have the teams dead even in terms of gold. 
Now, so unsuccessful ganks from Lee Sin. He's paid two or three visits into the lanes, has not been able to pick anything off just yet. Uh, has just got those boots in hand, and Jin Zhao has actually picked up the regrowth pendant as well as his fairy charm. So, Philosopher Stone coming up shortly. Gonna go the GP10 route. In the middle lane, we do see Goats putting a little bit more damage onto Hawkdon. Knowing that he's got no mana, knowing he's unable to actually uh, put any time bombs down. And then, obviously, just means he can apply a couple of auto attacks. But KG's lucky pick being picked up from Annie. Um, maybe Deathfire Grasp to go for that really huge burst that she's already got? I think I think that's going to be the strategy. Get as much early burst as humanly possible to make sure you can completely end the life of Zillion. Uh, has also put in three points in Disintegrate instead of going up the you know path through Incinerate. Um, and now we have, you know, kind of a situation bottom lane. You know, it's kind of on their back foot, but a Lee Sin gank is going to be incoming here. Could be a real big issue for the Soraka Corky combination. Of course, they do have flash up. Both of them have flash, are safe in that respect. But Lee Sin is coming down. So we do see the cripple. It's going to go out there. Kept their attention onto Flumus, but simply put, the heal is just too, too great. In the middle lane, Kalsar forced to flash away. Picks up the first blood into Zillion, trying to get away. He's not going to be able to be picked up. He does have Tibbers up. The Audacious Charge comes out somehow. Oh my Kalsar goodness. picks up a double. I am definitely going to rewind this one. Let's just get these numbers off screen very, very quickly and put this into... Oh, so we're going to replay this one and see how this actually plays out. Kalsar almost picking up level 6. Will just get level 6 as the gank is about to start. So time wave, there goes the level 6. Slow it down. Tibbers manages to stun both champions. Ignite goes down onto Hawk Dot. Follows it up as Tibbers is going to apply that last tick of damage. Count on one, two attacks. There's the second one. The third one is not going to land. Kautar just has that cooldown available for Disintegrate. And there goes the Disintegrate plus one more auto attack from Tibbers to pick up the double kill first blood. Immense, immense play from the little Pyromaniac. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, there was a point. Annie essentially got a bunch of buffs, and she was being played a lot, and then got a little bit of a nerf, and it completely disappeared from the competitive scene. But as you saw there, you know, an incredible amount of burst damage and lane presence coming down from Annie. And I really thought she was just going to be outranged and not really be able to do that much in the lane. Not the case so far. Has really been dominant. We did see a gank while you were... Oh, actually, you're reviewing it right now uh, that... El Mopo barely getting away from that concerted effort from Malphite and Lee Sin. I am just trying to jump up. I think I'm just going to fast forward to real time. Unfortunately, the spectator bug just sort of locks up and pauses from time to time when you're in fast forward mode. So I will bring us back up to live 0 2. The uh, Team Manga Shark have the early advantage, I and mean, then it does equate to 1,200 gold. But that is me now back up to live, and we've missed nothing else, nothing too exciting. Um, did Kaltod manage to steal that blue puff or was it just picked up now from uh, Lee Sin? Yeah. It was just picked up right now. So both of the AP middles do have their blue buff. Sometimes that also gets a little bit confusing there. It looks like it's on your screen as well. And we did see Xin Zhao was kind of camping out the... Uh, Rush really wanted to come in on Kautard. I think they feel like they need to do something about that Annie at this point in time, but nothing happening, and now it looks like a gank up top as well. Broto is going to be coming in, trying to get in position for that audacious charge. Imbersheep jukes through the bush, is going to land another ground slam onto Al Mupo. One more blade surge plus equilibrium strike, and Al Mupo doesn't even need the help from Broto, but he was in experience range, so at the very least he should have been able to pick up some of that XP from the kill. Yeah, I mean, he gets the experience, but he does not get, uh, you know, the assist, which would have been an extra, you know, 160 gold for his team. So that is unfortunate. Uh, meanwhile, Malphite still had his flash up, just I guess figured, oh, I'm not going to get away anyway. I'm not going to burn that flash. I, I, I like the thinking, you know, because we, we penalize players quite often when we go, right, you had flash available. They used flash a little bit too aggressively. Malphite was 2v1. They had the ability to dive with those champions, so... You know, I, I like the fact that he saved it, and it, and it was good thinking from Embersheep. Um, has the kill actually put him too far behind? He has a GP10 ticking. Similar CS levels to Irelia, and we'll see. What is Irelia going to spend this 900 gold on? Uh, is it going to be completing the Phage, or are we going to see... And in fact, it's going to be a Hex Drinker outright, and that's very wise move. Magic damage from Malphite, magic damage from Annie, and magic damage from Ezreal. So uh, I like the pickup, and I like the build on Irelia. And Annie, 85 farm to the 60 of Zillion, 25 farm ahead already, and those two kills, of course. 
Um, they do notice her heading down towards bottom, which is a good thing, because she would be devastating to this bottom lane combination. Flash is available, so is her summoners of, of Pyromania and, of course, summon Tibbers. So, you know, if you wanted to go for a big dive, land Tibbers, get a true shot barrage over them, and then potentially crescendo. Um, in actual fact, now thinking about that, that's a lot of Team AoE CC. Unstoppable Force, Tibbers, crescendo. Um, it's very, very strong. Broto is going to have his vision removed. There goes Audacious. One, two, immediate crescendo comes out from Nymad. Valkyrie is going to go forward. Up in the top lane, Irelia is going to go down. Compliments of a gank from Malphite and Lee Sin. But they pick up a kill on the bottom lane, so one for one exchange. Uh, were you watching the top lane by any chance? I was watching the top lane. Uh, really, Imbasheep did a really good job of baiting El Mopo into a battle. Uh, so they were going mono e mono, but Lee Sin was sneaking up, was able to catch up after the Unstoppable Force was used, and really turned the tides of the battle. Imbasheep almost went down. The Hex Drinker of Aurelia did proc, and that's actually kind of an unusual pickup for Aurelia, uh, if I may say so. I don't see Hex Drinker on her too often, but certainly would have been very effective had that fight really only been 1v1. But as it was a 2v1 with that Lee Sin coming in to help out, uh, things did not go well for El Mufo. And it's, uh, it must be quite a nice a nice feeling for Mr. Embersheep to pick up a kill against the player that he's actually replaced. There goes the Tebbers onto Hawkdown, Incinerate, Disintegrate. The Execute from Goat is going to come out, and this is going to allow Kautan all the cooldown time that he needs. Tebbers is going to be running after uh, Zillion, but that time warp speed buff is just too strong, and he manages to get himself to safety uh, with just the use of that Chrono Shift. Well, yeah, Chrono Shift, he did flash immediately after Chrono Shift as well to, you know, ensure that he was going to get out of that. Did do a good job, but now it looks like Team Megashot going to be able to pick up this first dragon in the game. It is 12 minutes in the game, and uh, in the top lane is down getting taken top down. Line. Yeah, huge, huge gank. Uh, El Mupo and Broto just pushing the entire time. Um, losing one death for Dragon, I would consider that a fair trade. Um, but an interesting thing, Broto and El Mopo took the entire lane from Middle River all the way to their tower to pick up that kill on Malphite. So his Philosopher's Stone, and I, I don't know if he had the Heart of Gold yet or not, but it took them a long time to get through the armor and through the amount of DPS, uh, the amount of health that Malphite actually had. Yeah, now they've kind of evened it up. They've taken that top lane, which is a good pickup, but I always feel like that's an easy thing to, you know, turn around. It's easy for top lane, you know, if they really are focused on it, to, you know, turn the lane around, take down the opposing turret. Um, so, Malphite will likely be able to push back, get that up. He does have a chainmail vest now, which will certainly help out his tankiness in that top lane, and we'll see if he's able to push this back. And uh, whether he or not he wants to push it back, he's not going to freeze it. We do see him take out all those creeps really quickly down there in the top of the lane and we do see Lee Sin coming in for a lane gank here. Emirate is going to go very low, Crescendo absolutely Ooh. misses unfortunately, compliments of a very nice uh, Valkyrie there from Corky. But uh, just a little bit slow, was poking, taking a lot of damage, trying to bait out the, the dive or you know try to pull Corky and Soraka forward but unfortunately took way more damage than was anticipating and you could see the panic in that Crescendo spell cast. <laughs> yes, it would be like, I better land this, or they better run away, or I am going to die. Uh, Kowtard continuing to do work in middle, but actually has not extended their, you know, their CS lead. If anything, Octon is catching up, not, no longer, you know, 20, 25 CS down, instead only 13. So really good job from Zillion to kind of catch up, even though he has been the focus of a, you know, quite a few gank attempts there from Lee Sin. Well, take a look at the gold, if you will. 5,300 on Annie to 3,800 on Zillion. In the top lane, Ember Sheep forced to use that Unstoppable Force to try to get away. Will, in fact, save his life. 99 hit points on the table. But 2,800 gold saved up for Kaltard. And he's actually camping out this red buff. If Broto moves forward, he may be in trouble, but... Counter are now deciding to maybe go in forward. If he can get the stun, Tibbers goes down, incinerate, disintegrate, ignite. Chrono Shift is going to oh. go up. Goat is going to position for the Dragon's Rage kick. It's not going to get it off in the right direction. Force backwards into Tower Range. Compliments of a great Crescent Sweep from Broto. And that gank, in fact, turns around. And uh, another kill going to the Game Hoppers. Oh my goodness, and that was... It was really unfortunate. It was just a split second before that Tempest Cripple landed that Zillion was able to get off his ultimate, get off that Chrono Shift, 
um, and come back to life and really turn around that battle. Of course, really great job by Broto as well, but that Ignite coming down from Zillion was able to seal the deal and really, you know, not a good sign of things to come if they can't burst down Zillion. The other thing to note, though, is Annie had so much gold saved up in her bank. Uh, you know, goes back to base, picks up that needlessly large rod, also has, you know, Sorcerer's Shoes picked up, and has another 600 gold to spend as of yet. So we're not seeing the DFG rush. Uh, I guess we're going to let, you know, Annie is going to let that kind of tick down, get more gold over the course of time. I thought something else might be happening, so I paused for a second there. But, uh, yeah, going to just go maybe perhaps straight for, towards this death cap, which will you know, certainly also give her a lot of burst, but maybe not the same amount of early game burst had she just picked up the death cap, which I think I'm almost actually positive she had enough gold to do on that back. Yeah, very, very close to it. I, I know I seen an entry with about 3,200 gold, so uh, pretty close to that. Hawkdown is still maintaining that 20 CS difference between the two champions. But Countdown has been playing very aggressively, has been trying to go for those big kills on Zillion before he's able to get that Chrono shift out. And you can see setup once again. Tibbers is available, Ignite is available. Leeson, there comes the Tibbers. Disintegrate, Incinerate, as well as the Ignite going down. Chrono shift was available for Hawkdown and he didn't even need to use it. So Kaltard blows everything for that. And unfortunately, all he secures is uh, a creep wave and a half of experience denial from Zillion. No, actually, it does pick up that turret, which is kind of an unusual strategy, um, but didn't really have an option. It had a really strong creep, creep wave incoming, so that turret would have taken it all on its own, allowed the bear to help on out as well. Uh, top lane is actually really going in Aurelia's favor, but earlier on didn't actually have a huge minion lead, and it's still only 8, which is a little bit surprising, seeing as how you know they have been able to dominate every single one of those duels with that Malphite, and is actually going to be aggressive against them once again. So Equilibrium Strike goes down, Heat and Style is up, Al Mupo doing that uh, auto attack dive, auto attack dive, or, or move or action rather, is just really trading evenly. Even if Al Mupo goes low, he's going to have that Hexdrinker shield to come up in the bottom lane. We do see Ezreal forced to flash away, is going to die oh! to the Ignite. 48 HP and the last tick of Ignite is going to pick it off. And uh, a very, very aggressive Corky able to go what looked like 1v2. Crescendo wasn't actually used from Sona, so... Another easy kill in the bottom lane for uh, the game hoppers. Yeah, uh, another pickup. Great job landing that final, uh, that final big one that really did the little bit of extra damage that Ezreal was not expecting. Oh, El Mopo. He's gonna flash forward. There goes the ward placement down from Goats. If he can land the Sonic Wave, it could have been enough to execute, but unfortunately, it's not gonna be the situation. Um, take a look at the item build right now. Uh, Ezreal is about 300 gold away from finishing his Infinity Edge, but Corky has opted to go for the Trinity Force build. So, whose build do you prefer? going into this team fight stage now that we got three towers down on the map. I'm, I'm definitely going to prefer Corky's build since he is 2-0 and, oh and also about 30 CS up. Um, but more seriously, I like the Trinity Force. If you only have one big item, Trinity Force is the best big item in my book for those mid-game fights especially. Infinity Edge is a superior attack damage carry item over the course of time because eventually you'll build up and you'll get that Phantom Dancer, but without that extra attack speed and critical strike, I don't feel it's quite as strong. Uh, so I do feel like Corgi has the advantage here. They are going to go in for this dragon. So time bombs have gone down. Kaltar and Goats dropped to less than half health before the fight has even begun. Drake is still going oh, on. Oh my god. Uh, uh, Irelia is able to pick up the kill onto El Mopo in the background. I'm going to carry on following her as the rest of uh, the game hoppers are going to finish off that dragon. True Shot Barrage goes out, is not able to steal, unfortunately. A very, very nice smite coming out from Broto means they secure that one. And now Hawkdown should be able to steal the blue buff as well. Yeah, so a really, really nice exchange coming down there. So the early aggression from Kautar not really paying dividends. I mean, it's still 2-0, still has a 20 CS lead in their lane, but really not being able to capitalize. And a lot of the other lanes not going quite as stellarly. Uh, Corky has been able to farm up, you know, straight away. And now, you know, the big advantage of having that extra turret in that middle lane is about to disappear as well as game hoppers take that down in very short notice. Well, let's not get too excited here quickly, because take a look at the gold difference. Two towers and a dragon difference, and it's only a 1,500 gold difference between these two teams. So where is all of that cash being made up? Is it purely the GPT? 
I, it must be the GP10s. That's really the only way to explain it, because the farm is pretty equal across the lanes. Annie, I mean, does have 20 some up on Zillion, but that is about the only lead they have in any of the lanes. Pogton once again going to use that Chrono Shift and survive. You know, Annie has a lot of damage. Oh, and it doesn't actually even go off. So uh, didn't need to use the Chrono Shift. Did use it just in case. But Zillion able to survive all that burst from Annie. I mean, did get that early kill in that first gank. Picked up those double kills. But since then, Zillion has just been tanky enough to survive. And I think that's in large part because he's gone a very tanky build. Those Mercury Treads into Rod of Ages. And now picking up another Blasting Wand. Which most likely will be turned into a Death Cap. And I really, really like that itemization when you consider that Zillion, um, his damage begins to fall off the longer the game goes. He, he ends up sort of transitioning a little bit more into, uh, I use the term very loosely, but like a utility mage. Um, his damage is still pretty good if he goes max AP, but 30, 35 minutes onwards it drops off. And then of course, opting to go for the, the Merc Treads and allowing himself to survive longer, get more time bombs out over the course of a fight. And looking at his lineup, Corky, Irelia, and Jin Zhao, they're going to be able to clean up, they're going to be able to survive long enough, and one of them's going to get a chrono shift. So in a team fight, any one of them is scary, but there's three of them to contend with. Chrono shift, uh, we do see that uh, Sona is going to be dived on. The safeguard comes out, follows it up with a crescendo, but the rest of um, Team Mega Shock are too scared to commit and pick up that kill. And I'm not sure with the thinking of that. Now we see Hawked on, flashes forward, ignites, plus time bomb. Is it going to be enough? Sona is going to survive somehow. Now Chrono Shift is available once again. That rewind cooldown is so, so strong. We just seen Hawked on using it to survive the previous engagement and using it a second time to survive this engagement. And in actual fact, nobody goes down after all of those ultimates. Yeah, an interesting thing in top lane as well, uh, you know, hopefully everyone will be calm for a moment as, as, I, uh, as I pay attention to this. Brutal Strikes was leveled up along with Ground Slam for Malphite. Instead of putting any extra points in Seismic Shard, only had one point, now has two, but just picked that up once he hit level 14. So kind of an unusual build. We see a lot of people ignoring Brutal Strikes early on especially, and just going for, you know, the burst damage that Seismic Shard and Ground Slam give you in combination. Uh, so kind of an unusual build seems to be turning out okay you know he's been able to keep up and farm he was really aggressively camped early on there were a lot of ganks going towards his direction so him being able to keep up the farm pretty good sign has picked up that frozen heart does also have mercury treads um, and those two gp10s are ticking down Kalsard is forced to use his stun just to save himself against uh, Zen Zhao. Crescent Sweep comes out. Kalsard is going to go down before the time bomb can go off. Uh, just quickly looking at the gold. Malphite, in fact, 500 gold ahead of Irelia. Only with one kill, 10 CS advantage, and it's purely because of those two GP10s. 452 gold earned on the Philosopher's Stone, 354 gold earned on that uh, Heart of Gold, and that makes up that small advantage. But a good kill in the middle lane there onto Annie. And the game hoppers are slowly, slowly trying to pull ahead. But Gold is still in the lead of Mega Shock. That is very, very <laughs> impressive. I mean, it's got to be those GP10s. I mean, obviously in middle lane, that Kage lucky pick is helping out. As I mean, as is the farm. I mean, Annie is actually almost about 40 CS ahead. So she is doing a really great job. Kowtard playing her and has that Tibbers up, has Ignite up, has Flash up, is hoping to pick up a kill somewhere along the line here. Corky is looking so incredibly strong, though. Has the Trinity Force and the better parts of an Infinity Edge. Uh, really just needs another... You know, five to seven hundred gold, I think, to finish off all the components and purchase that Infinity Edge. Uh, it's still running along with Boots 1, so there is that, but, uh, you know, once they actually pick up the extra, you know, that extra damage from Infinity Edge, it's going to be so hard to stop, as we've seen in earlier games. Corky with those two item builds is very, very destructive. What is that next um, uh, uh, Null Magic Mental going to become for Irelia? Zeal, Phage, and somewhat of an arbitrary Null Magic? Uh, you know, my guess, my best guess would be an eventual Guardian Angel. Probably just wants to get it to survive now. We'll likely finish up Trinity Force and then go for a Guardian Angel would be my guess. 
are going to see a potential engagement here. Everybody's just waiting for the right time. Audacious Charge comes up, followed by the Crescent Suit. Knocks all the members of Mega Shock aside. Now they're on the back foot. True Shot Barrage goes up, manages to hit absolutely nobody. A great unstoppable force, followed up by Summon Turbos. Means both Al Mupo and uh, Hawkson are in fact stunned up. But Chrono Ship comes up. He's going to bring himself back to life just for a brief second. So Aurelian Malphite are down. Top laners have both been removed, followed very quickly by both junglers. And what is effectively a completely even team fight means that now uh, the, the game hoppers are trying to push down against Team Mega Shark, and with Soraka there being able to top up the mana and the hit points, who is going to come out advantageous? The big, big one into Gatlin Cannon, followed up by another rock uh, uh, missile barrage. Mr. Rolls closes that fight out, so a 3 to 2 exchange at the end of it. But can you believe the team fight? Both tops and both junglers going down. I, I can hardly believe it. Corky really benefiting from that is now sitting at 5 and 0. Um, but now that shield's coming back, wanting to put some damage on there, but not going to be able to do it. So we've actually seen Cowtard run up there and then followed up by Echnus running up there, you know, trying to go in against that. You know, that Zillion and Corky combination and really underestimating the damage. And if they're underestimating the damage now, I mean, just wait until Corky goes back. He has 2,500 gold to spend. He's going to pick up that Infinity Edge. Likely will pick up Boots too. And he's going to be, you know, just a whole nother beast for this next team fight. So, I mean, that team fight eventually went even. It went three for three. But over the course of it, you know, as the fight evolved, we saw Game Hoffers pick up an extra turret and an extra two kills. And uh, in terms of the, the gameplay, it was really smart. You know, we've seen Ezreal using Arcane Shift to get into range of the tower, immediately followed up with the Infuse and the Time Warp from Soraka and Zillion. So there was no way he could go, even if he wanted to try to run away. If Mega Shock do manage to pick up this dragon, uh, it could turn things a little bit in their favor, uh, at least as far as the gold goes. But are we going to see a Baron coming from the likes of Game Hoppers? Their team could take it down pretty quickly. I mean, Corky, Zinn, and Irelia are all pretty strong auto attackers, and uh, they could chunk it down in fairly quick time. Yes, they certainly could. You know, interesting notes on the items that have been bought in the last minute. Deathfire Grass from Annie, that's going to give extra burst. Aurelia Trinity Force, also extra burst. Reverie from Zen, that's a good pickup. Soraka's picked up the Oracle Elixir. And instead of going back and Quirky really picking up that extra, you know, couple of damage items, has instead decided to go straight for the Guardian Angel. Because he went back, he had like exactly 2,600 gold. He's like, I can afford a Guardian Angel. I'm going to pick that up. I do a lot of damage. I already know I do enough damage for these team fights. Now let's make sure I'm tanky and can survive throughout the course of them. So he has that extra life. Well, we do see a bit of an engagement. They immediately followed up with a resonating strike, but Goat's not willing to throw up the Dragon's Rage kick or flash dragons because in actual fact, something I didn't even notice, <laughs> Exhaust no flash. Smite. Yeah, no flash on Lee Sin. Um, I don't know how on earth I didn't see that. But uh, let's take a look at the engagement. There comes Blaze. Search. Equal Liver Strike down as a Kalsar. Kalsar is going to get deleted before this fight can even begin. Doesn't even manage to get Tibbers off, unfortunately. So the first one down for Mega Shark is their AP middle. Member Sheep is trying to stick onto Mr. Rolls in the background. Is finally going to get taken out. While all of this is going on, Broto is able to scare both Ethnics and Nimar away. Look at those dashes. Audacious Charge followed up by Blaze Surge in the background. Valkyrie comes down as well. And Game Hoppers should be able to force down an inhibitor here. They've got a lot of time to do it. No creeps just yet, but only Sona. So we do see Flumis is going to start tanking this. Astral Blessing will come up in just a second. I like that play. They waited for the cooldown. They waited for uh, um, Soraka to go, you know what? I have my cooldown available in a couple of seconds. Delay it. Let me get that armor. Let me get that extra HP in. And inhibitor down for Game Hoppers. This is going to put them in a very strong position to take Baron in the next couple of minutes. Yeah, I mean, they could potentially rush to it straight away, and I like how they leave the inhibitor with just enough minions there to pick it up. Uh, Hawkton, you know, being in a little bit of a dangerous spot here, he is spotted out by that ward, and him not going back means you could potentially see a counter baron here. Uh, you know, everyone else on the team does have to go back, but they know the Hawkton took that extra, you know, three, four seconds to kill those race, and so we now see ten me Team Mega Shock rushing towards Baron. Are they going to potentially do it? Now they know Corky's around too, and Corky doesn't have very much life. Unfortunately, they showed themselves, so Hawkdun does not go back, um, which means they would be in a very precarious situation if they wanted to do Baron, because they'd ha potentially have a lot of bombs being dropped on their head over the course of time. Uh, so that, that is not a good thing. Team Megashock isn't going to be able to take advantage of what could have been an error from Hawkdun, but instead, 
he really corrected it by sticking around, making sure he would, there, he would, there was a presence there uh, to really hold off that Baron attempt. And now we see Corky does have that Infinity Edge, still no Boots 2. So it is 30 minutes into the game, no Boots 2 from Corky, 7-0 has other things to spend his money on. So we've been watching a lot of Ezreal over the course of the last, the course of the last two days, and the majority of Ezreals we've seen have actually gone Trinity Force first. This time around, 1-3-1 one, one on Ez, i.e. into Phantom Dancer. Do you think that's potentially what's causing them some problems in these fights, or is it purely just positioning and the fact that, you know, they lost Annie very early in that previous team fight, and um, they've been caught out a couple of times uh, before that as well? I'm pretty certain it's a matter of positioning. I mean, Ezreal... Well, look at this engagement. Going to be Al Mukla goes so, so aggressive. Dies forward. Crescent Sweep is going to knock everybody back, but that actually ended up pushing Mega Shock a little bit to safety. An unstoppable force knocks up four out of five members of the game. Hoppers, time bombs in the background. Audacious was tr used to try to get to safety. She didn't. His carry on to push forward. So Irelia and Sona are the two dead people right now, but Lee Sin is going to follow very, very shortly, and somehow Etnix has managed to get away with his life. Imba Sheep is running away like a sheep right now. Going to be slowed down. Time bomb number one is going to go out. Time bomb number two will come up very, very shortly, and uh, it does chunk off a decent amount of HP. Zillion and Soraka should be able to pick this one up. Ground slam goes up. He is, in fact, going to pick up a kill before going down to the kill, but uh, Rawls with that Guardian's Angel, Infinity Edge, and Trinity Force completed. Manages to pick up Annie in the background. The only member of Team Mega Shock alive was Ezreal. He was out of that fight very early on. But I was a bit nervous as that started because that Crescent Sweep sort of pushed everybody to safety and then Malphite had a great unstoppable force but unfortunately no crescendo to lock everybody else up. Now Ezreal is trying to pick a fight with Corky and I'm sorry dude but you're not going to come off better in that situation. No, certainly not, considering Corky also has that Guardian Angel lined up on himself. So even if he had lost that fight, he would have popped back into the battle. Uh, you know, that was a pretty extended Baron take because, of course, Zinzao, you know, despite doing a, you know, a really stellar job in those team fights, and I actually saw when he used his odd, his Crescent Sweep, rather, he had over 260 armor and magic resist. So it was so incredibly tanky. He has gone, you know, a very, you know, defensive support-oriented build, rushing that Aegis of the Legion. Now it looks like he's going to pick up that Randoin's Omen, but he has been very stellar in those team fights, cause disruption in the back lines, grab a lot of that aggression onto himself, um, and he's not falling, so that is a really great showing. 0-0-16 as well from Soraka, not too shabby. 11-0-4 from Corky, so overall 11-0-20 from that bottom lane from Game Hoppers. That is immense when you put it that way. 11 0 20 in the bottom lane. Ezreal's picked up another zeal. I anticipate that that's going to become a Trinity Force. I, I don't see him going double Phantom Dancer. Um, you know, maybe, maybe that there's an Infinity Edge. It's a possibility, but I think he needs the life. Oh, we do see Annie is going to court out one, two procs of that uh, uh, three talent strike. He's going to be activated. I really has jumped in between five, gets exhausted. In actual fact, Dragon's Rage kicked backwards. True Shot Barrage goes up. And then the question sweep from Broto. Annie is actually going to go down in and amongst all of that. That was two versus five. That was Zin versus the team and I really are versus the team. Blade surges forward. Equal Emblem strikes. Holds Malphite in place for a couple of seconds. He is going to be forced to flash over the wall. A big one from Corgi is going to pick up the kill onto Lee Sin. They're going to carry on with this dive, follow it up with a time bomb kill onto Malphite. And Zinzao and Irelia, not even afraid of a full five man team of Team Mega Shock. Yeah, we do see the good games well played coming out. Of course, you know, the two carries, well, Irelia and Corky both having their own Guardian Angel in addition to, you know, the backup Chrono Ship from Zillion, which they haven't even needed in the last couple of fights, um, impressively enough. And it was unfortunate because we saw really great play from Kowtard early on, but, you know, in that last fight he was just waiting, waiting, waiting for the whole team to gather up so he could use the Tibbers to really put a lot of burst damage on, but ended up dying before that, you know, even happened. Uh, so really unfortunate positioning as the game wore on. Of course, we always talk about how Lee